Hey ladies and gents, welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast, where we talk about video games and everything happening in the industry, episode 133. As always, I'm joined by Jordan. Milk Mommy! <laughs> uh, no Dom this week, he uh, had Valentine's Day plans, Jordan and I didn't, so that's why you're here. Um, you know, welcome Jordan? I was waiting for the, for the welcome here, I didn't get any welcome. You know, Jared... I was going to save this for the end of the show because I wanted it to be a big deal, but since you brought it up, you know, <laughs> I'm just so glad that we're able to spend this time together on Valentine's Day, you know. Ours doesn't happen to be a romantic relationship, but that doesn't mean we can't spread love, you know. And I'm just so absolutely grateful for you to be in my presence and speaking to me over the internet waves in the way that you are on this broadcast show that we're doing. It's absolutely incredible. It's absolutely fantastic, Jared. You're very lucky I'm not one of those people with, like, a hungry ego because, God, I would go on a buffet tear right now. <laughs> Just om nom eating all that up. Um, exactly. No, yes. That's, the, that's why I can do the joke. It wouldn't be funny <laughs> if you were, like, some asshole. Yes, it's more. Like, more, know, right? more. It's great that I'm here, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so no Dom this week, so just me and Jordan. We have some Nintendo news to go over later. Um, a bunch of quickie news regarding a bunch of different things. Um, quite a bit, actually. And for the record, it's called quickie news because they're stories that I can read over and we can go past really quickly or we can talk about them. Not necessarily that the segment itself is going to be very quick. Just so that way people well, know about that. it's mostly just because Jared loves a quickie. Exactly. It's really Exactly. Fun. It's on theme too, uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, anyways, hopefully not, and, hopefully not just a quickie on Valentine's Day. Hey man, people live busy lives. You never know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gotta fit it in. It, whoa. Um, yeah. So, in terms of uh, what we've been playing, I actually didn't have a whole uh, lot of free time to play video games. So I didn't even play Apex really. I didn't really play Kingdom Hearts that much. Whoa. I got about I want to say about an hour and a half in Kingdom Hearts, which is really nothing, right? Um, so I started up the Tangled World. I haven't got past it yet, um, just because I didn't have a the whole lot of time. The Kingdom of Corona. Um, looks like the movie, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't really say much there because I haven't had made, I haven't made much progress. Uh, Apex, uh, the couple of matches I was able to get in, still a blast. Um, the cool thing, it's probably the same on PlayStation, is uh, so one of my biggest pet peeves with multiplayer only games. Jordan with trophies or achievements is that they tend to have like a long they either have a long list of like 40% things that are easy to do and then 60% that have to do with like leaderboards or something crazy right or yeah, being the best in the world for 100 days straight or they're very short lists with a bunch of very hard stuff right um, the thing with Apex that I really enjoy is that it's it, like I said it's probably the same on PlayStation they don't really deviate that much um it's, I think, 12 achievements total, and uh, you get an achievement for winning a game with each of the classes. So you get an achievement, 75 gamer score, which would probably be like a silver or gold or whatever on PlayStation, um, for winning with each class, so defense, support, tracker, and offense. There's an achievement for doing uh, X amount of damage with each of the characters, which is 5,000. And you, if you're like just like an average player, you'll get that in like ten-ish matches. You know what I mean? All right. So, uh, some of the other achievements are for uh, revving a teammate, uh, being the jump master at the beginning of the game, which simply means you're the third person to pick, so you get to choose where people land. So it's just up to you playing the game. You know what I mean? Just you being the jump master it doesn't really matter. Um, and even then, jump man. if you're playing with two other friends, they can relinquish the role of jump master to you. So if you're like, hey, I just want to get the achievement out of the way, they, you can just um, do it that way too. Cheese it a little bit, which isn't really cheesing. It's you're jumping into the map, right? Um, yeah. But it has a very short, concise achievement list. And the achievements are, I want to say easy to get because it's not easy to win a battle royale match, right? But they're, yeah. they're in reach. They're not crazy. They're not some weird leaderboard thing. Um, Obtainable. <clears throat> I think the hardest achievement in the game is to get wear a legendary chest piece and helmet at the same time. Which even then, I th if you're good at the game, you can when you kill people, you loot their body. The chance of ha that happening is not impossible, right? And then one of the other achievements is to have a fully kitted gun, so all the attachments on it. Not hard either. I just really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate the. Um, 
the achievement list. I think it's very solid. I think people are complaining because it doesn't have a platinum on PlayStation, but we've gone over that argument of like <laughs> the way developers interact with PlayStation in terms of getting a, a platinum trophy. They're told no. Hey, but if you just ask again, they'll do it. It's a weird, convoluted thing. It's dumb. It's fucking dumb bullshit. Clearly, this game could have a platinum. Exactly. Um, yeah, so not much to uh, report on Kingdom Hearts. Not much to report on uh, Apex. I just wanted to get that out of the way for the achievements because I thought it was something interesting to talk about. Um, have in terms you of seen Tangled and Frozen, Jared? Uh, yes. Have you seen Big Hero 6? Uh, yes, it's one of my favorite Disney movies, actually. Nice. Okay, so you're going to be familiar with all these worlds that we're coming across, obviously. I'm sure you've seen Toy Story and Monsters, Inc. and Pirates of the Caribbean. So, um, <clears throat> How about that Tangled Tower, huh? I feel like they just fucking focused on that a lot. Like the Rapunzel's Tower, they really wanted to make that <laughs> yeah. look good. It looks um, really good in the movie, so, you know, it looks really good in the game. Too. Well, just even the scene, like, when you first get to the world and you're with Flynn and he's running away and stuff, and then you go into that, like, little hidden area and you come out the other side and it's a tower. It's like, this, we want this to be the showpiece, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah. Even the cutscene with her and, and Flynn from the, you know, kind of like from the movie in the tower is, looks great, too. Um, yeah. I would say that this... Maybe of any Kingdom Hearts world is the closest I've ever seen to a movie where it's like almost like a shot for shot remake in a lot of areas. My nostalgic child brain really thought that Tarzan and Hercules looked like it, but that's my like kid child brain from Kingdom Hearts 1, you know what I mean? If I were to actually look at it as an adult well, and stuff, even... I'd be like, oh no looking like it but the actual like story scene yeah exactly yeah him actually doing like moment to moment the exact thing of the like when she's got him tied up and she's smacking him in the face with the frying pan and they're um up in the tower like <laughs> Sora and his gang are nowhere to be found and they're just doing the tangled movie like I thought that was really interesting so I like Kingdom of Corona a lot I think it's a great uh Kingdom Hearts world um real quick one thing that I was interested in is uh, when Kingdom Hearts first came out, it was sitting on Metacritic, like at a an open critic, like at a ninety three or something crazy, and we obviously knew that was probably going to come down as more reviews came in. It actually surprised me um, how low it dropped, and not that it, it didn't drop to a low low score, but it's sitting at about like an eighty four eighty five right now. So it's like an eight point whatever. Yeah. Um, which I playing the game so far, I think that's kind of a good grade. I wouldn't say it's a ninety three. At the time, I was like, that's kind of yeah. high. Um, so it's fine. Uh, I was looking at uh, PlayStation versus Xbox, and um, Xbox is sitting at a 79. It reviewed lower, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, I will say that um, I'm, I can pretty definitively say at this point, I, I didn't beat it. I wanted to finish it up, but um, I just got further into the Caribbean. I'm at uh, Port Royal, um, or just got there, I should say, and kind of did that whole area. Um but I think, you know, unfortunately the the difficulty is just like throwing the whole experience off for me. And uh, I do enjoy Kingdom Hearts for the gameplay. So I think that uh, Birth by Sleep is still going to have the crown once it's all said and done as far as uh, my favorite game in the series. So Yeah, I didn't have large expectations going in personally because it's like... You know, I hadn't played all the spinoff ones. I mean, I like Kingdom yeah. Hearts, but obviously not to the extent that you do. And Dom's, I think, closer to you, but in between both of us. Um, yeah. But I'm enjoying my time with it. It's kind of what I expected, for better or worse. I've said that in the past couple of weeks. Um, mm -hmm. I can't wait to play more. Hearing that the Pirates of the Caribbean world is towards the end is kind of disappointing to me because that's, like, the world I was least excited to go to. I've just never been a huge fan yeah. of that franchise, personally. It looks beautiful, but it's just not what what I was stoked for, like the you know, the Monsters Inc. and stuff like that. So um yeah. in terms of other stuff, I actually went back and tried rewatching Sex Education on Netflix and it actually pans out pretty interesting. Like I kinda gave up on the show right away and I went back. Um and it's actually pretty funny. Um the kid's mom is uh, a sex therapist and he's uh, 16 or 17 years old and he's never been able to masturbate in his life um, and basically what happens is by the end his mom was always doing it for him. god 
Uh, but his mom, his mom is very detached from men, but she always has like a new guy over sleeping, you know, sleeping with her. And they always, one of the, the ongoing gags in the show is whenever they wake up in the morning to go to the bathroom, they always accidentally walk into his room, like in a robe. I'm like, oh, sorry. Hi, my name's Robert or whatever. And his response is always like, oh, you're not going to be here tomorrow. Kind of, you know, um, but basically what ends up happening, this is at the end of the first ep- first and second episode, so it's not like a spoiler or anything. He ends up partnering with a girl in the school, and they start a sex therapy company together. Um, she needs the money. He just wants to be a cool kid, right, because he's kind of a loser. So they partner together to help kids at their school get over uh, issues that they're having sexually. Um, it's really funny. Um, the actor is kind of weird. It's a kid from... Uh, uh, help me out. The space movie with Harrison Ford, where the kids train to be pilots and stuff. Oh, uh, uh, Orson Scott Card, Ender's Game. Ender's Game. That it's the kid actor from that movie, and he's not ugly or anything. He just has a very like unique face. So that was kind of interesting to get because he's not normally in these kind of shows. They have like a handsome leading man type character. You know what I mean? Like a handsome teen dude. So for this one, it's just kind of getting over that. And it's British humor, which can be dry at times. And it doesn't always click with me, but I'm enjoying the show nonetheless. Um, still watch, still on my Breaking Bad train. Um, nice. I'm trying to remember the last episode. I'm st- I still haven't gotten to where I left off when I stopped watching it. I just end up uh, finished watching Peekaboo, which is the episode with the two uh, druggies and their kid, the little red-headed yeah. kid. I know which, exactly what you're talking about. That's before I stopped watching. That was probably my favorite episode. Um, I, I just it, Je- up shit, man. Jesse's connection with the kid and stuff is really heartbreaking. Um, and then on the opposite end, Walt having to deal with uh, I forgot the lady's name, but his ex obviously coming to their house and stuff. It's a good episode. Kids living in really fucked up situations is like my thing. Like that'll it's awful. Right up under my skin. Yeah. Also, something funny I I found out about myself this last week. I, for some reason, you know how, like, f- s- even an emotional scene, as emotional as it is, might not resonate with people, and sometimes it resonates a lot with some people more than others. For some reason... Yeah, your personal experience. For some reason, the Spider-Man scene in Infinity War, when he's telling uh, Tony he doesn't feel good and he's sorry, it gets me every time. I don't know what it is every time that and maybe it's just Tom Holland for some reason I resonate with his emotional acting but in Homecoming when he towards the end when he gets crushed by the vulture and he's crying out for help oh yeah. man oof does a number on me man I don't know why just every time does a number every time um in terms of comics I can get to what you've been playing um caught up on everything I was about a week or two behind and um it's very difficult in comics when you get behind like that, you know. Um, and that's the that's it's a breaking point where you have to decide, okay, I'm just going to take a break from comics because it is a little overwhelming. That's one of the issues with comics, right? One of the flaws right. with it. Or just buckle down and be like, oh, I'm actually really enjoying this. I don't feel like I need a break. And that's what I did. I buckled down. I read through stuff, caught up. Um, you know what I have to do every now and then, Jared, is I just have to cut my losses and say... There's too many things being released. And yeah. We talk about it with video games, with TV shows, movies. With comics, it is ten times worse. Yep. And, but the thing is, is a lot of them are still really fucking good. Like, even yeah. the stuff that you may think, like, oh, I would never fuck with that. Then you're like, wait, who's writing that? Who's drawing that? Oh, geez, I gotta check this out. But anyways, <clears throat> I just have started being like, I'm cutting this series from my list. You know, Exactly, yeah. My, from my reading list like I just can't and I'll just uh, the other thing is for the most part uh, a lot of comics come out you know 12 issues a year so even if you were like I'm cutting this and then you catch up on everything you're looking for someone to, something to read and you're like I did like that series I want to get back to it it's been a, a year and a half since I've read it that's 18 issues you could catch that up in a couple hours So unless it's Uncanny X-Men that releases every week for some reason <laughs> Yeah, there's certain things like that, or, yeah. you know, DC's biggest characters releasing twice a month is obnoxious, there's stuff like that, but um, even still, it's just, you gotta you gotta cut some things, like, there's heroes that you want to be following, but um, 
you know they're kind of like getting in the way or whatever and their book isn't the best that's another thing is when there's too many really great comic books to be like oh this book's good i feel like it's gonna get there you know you can't just keep waiting sometimes so it's like video games like we're so spoiled nowadays with selection with video games that yeah a seven comes out and it's like for instance crackdown came out not great reviews right well it didn't come out yet but it's getting not great reviews Back in the day, dude, if that game came out and it was a 7, I would still... That wouldn't deter me from buying it. But it's just that nowadays we have so many good games. There's games I haven't purchased yet that I want to get to. So it's like, do I want to spend time with this game that isn't great when there's so many great things that I also want to play and it's choosing? For comics, I cut off Superman, which I wasn't actually disliking. I was enjoying it, but I wasn't enjoying it as much as other stuff. And like you said, there comes a point where you're like, I got to trim some of the fat. It's not that I'm not enjoying this comic. It's that I realistically need to create more time for myself with the stuff I really love. Um, Exactly. Like right now, my personal favorite comic that's ongoing is Punisher. Uh, Eight released this week. Yeah, really enjoying it. Um, I think five was the last one I read, so I am a little bit behind, but, you know, that's nothing. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite comics right now. Friendly neighbor, uh, friendly neighborhood Spider Man's only two issues in. That's by Tom Taylor. Enjoying that. Um, Miles Morales is good too. We talked about that before. Um, the series that is just released this week that I haven't had a chance to read yet is a new twelve issue series, uh, which is Avengers No Road Home, uh, oh, yeah. which looks really interesting. So I can't wait to pop that open and read that. Um, and then another comic that I picked up. It's only three issues in, but people are raving about it. Um, is Die? I'm assuming you've heard of Die. So, um, Jared, Die. Do you mind if I jump in here? No, go ahead. You can even go onto your games afterwards too. I'm done. Okay, cool. Um, so, Die is Kieran Gillen, right? Which I'm sure yeah. you've heard by now. And he's, uh, I know I've mentioned him before. He's written some of my favorite stuff and is, uh, you know, even at this point doing Star Wars books. So, he's really kind of like risen. Uh, very sharp in the industry. Well, he has. I mean, he's he's like ascended, if you will. <clears throat> and Die was one of those books that uh, was being advertised in the back of other books that I was reading. Yep. And I was getting really hyped on it. And then all of a sudden, one day, I realized I had been passing over Die. Like, I had seen the first ep- couple issues of Die. And it was like one of those image comics where I'm like, oh, a new image comic. I can't just keep like trying out new image comics because I just get, you know, kind of uh, oversaturated with them, right? But then three issues in, I was looking at die number three and I was like, oh my God, no, this is the Kieran Gillen one. <laughs> and so I jumped in and read all three really quick and I was like, oh yeah, this is fucking cool ass series where die refers to dies in the plural of dice. And but also kind of refers to death, and then um, it's like uh, Jumanji in a fantasy world where they get sucked into this tabletop game. I can't wait um, to dive in. I have him on my iPad. I haven't gotten to him yet, but I can't. Oh, wait. so you haven't read it? Oh, okay. no. I was just no. about to be like, I bet you like the part <laughs> in a, a issue two where they no yada yada. But um, I I had heard so much about it, and I was like, finally, like. You know, I'm not super attached to Dungeons and Dragons. It's not that I'm not interested. It's just that I've never had like the friend group to do it or whatever. Same here. Um, yeah, same. But it's like the concept, uh, the overall concept, and then obviously the prestige of the writer. I'm like, okay, I'm in. I'm gonna give it a shot. So, yeah, yeah. I downloaded them. They're on my iPad right now. Yeah. So three issues in, and it's definitely a cool fantasy book, um, and has some like. You know when you, like, jump into fantasy and they're dropping lore names like Moonwalker and random shit like that? Yeah. And you're just like, ooh, I want to learn, learn about that lore. Like, what's the guild of the ancients or whatever, you know? Um, and The so Shadow Society. Of, it's like, ooh, what's, what's yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's already a lot of cool lore drops that they've had. And um, the thing is, is... Um, the story is them getting sucked back into the game. They got sucked into the game and then just like showed up on the side of the road somewhere and what had happened to them in the game came through in real life like somebody had lost their arm and shit. So um, this is the story of the comic is them actually getting sucked back into it. And uh, yeah, so far it's been really fucking cool and it is kind of 
you know, there's some times where I like just a straight fantasy or a straight sci-fi where it doesn't have to have a twist on it where it's like, well, it's fantasy, but really it's like normal modern people that got sucked into a board game, you know? Yeah. It's not just regular old fantasy. So um, that can, can suck sometimes when, when we get so, I feel like <clears throat> a lot of times nowadays we get so wrapped up in like the twist of the story to kind of hook people in whether it be a TV show or a movie or whatever, um, that sometimes it's like, well, there's still really great straight fantasy stories to be told, but nonetheless, uh, this is this is really doing it for me. So yeah, shout out to Die. I'm glad you brought that up. Shout out. Shout out. You talked um, about uh, Kingdom Hearts. Anything else there outside of almost being done with it? Yeah, um... Not a whole lot to say about Kingdom Hearts, like I said. Um, Pirate's World. uh, Definitely need to finish it because we're getting... I mean, the spoilers are spreading like a plague on the internet, especially on YouTube, because Kingdom Hearts is big on YouTube. All the theory videos and stuff, channels that have been going on over the years in between games are now exploding with new content to talk about, so it makes sense, but uh, nonetheless, I've got to gotta keep dodging and uh, that's getting old so um, want to finish that played finished uh, Bayonetta on Switch hell yeah and enjoyed that game very much um, far from perfect I wouldn't say it's like a, a swimming in seven type of game I, I do think it's a great game um, but you know it was interesting to have gone through you know God of War 4 basically on uh, earlier this year or earlier last year and then kind of go back to a game that was more like the classic formula for that series and uh, feel those feels again um, so I definitely like having that old school vibe uh, around still to play if you want to jump into a game series like this I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, Astral Chain looks kind of cool uh, another game from Platinum and some of the team members behind Bayonetta uh, that they just announced for Switch. Uh, of course, we got Bayonetta 3 coming up, so I'll be hopping into Bayonetta 2 in between now and then at some point. Not sure when, but am uh, excited for it because uh, Bayonetta 2 is supposed to be like the fucking game. Like, it got a lot of uh, tins and Game of the Year awards back in the day when it was released, so. Um, yeah, Bayonetta was very cool. The game ends like three times. It's, you know, over the top. It's um, extremely Japanese uh, influenced. Um, but it's a very fun hack and slash. I really thought the angels versus, versus witches and demons uh, storyline and lore was cool. And <clears throat> the story itself uh, throughout the game is, is really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And. I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. So, uh, yeah, really enjoyed Bayonetta. And I think, um, you know, the both games being released on the Switch, I think, is, is solid. So, um, is a solid way to hop back into that series. Oh, and then I also watched the uh, anime film that they did. Hmm. Uh, that's kind of like a um, retelling, I guess you could say, of the first game, so that was a good little watch after I finished that, and actually really enjoyed that as well. Also, I meant to mention to you, Jared, uh, your boy, uh, Yuri Lowenthal actually voices one of the main characters. Ooh, cool. Um, Luca, aka Cheshire, in, uh, Bayonetta, and funny enough, he has some kind of, like, Spider-Man-ish lines, and even has a zip line that he swings around on and like there's this part where he's like got this little girl in his arms and he's like swinging around on this zip line totally being spider-man for a little while i'm like holy shit this is a weird like confluence also interesting fun fact jared the original game was a was voiced in english and they didn't have a japanese cast until they picked them up for the anime movie that i just mentioned and Weird. then that Jap- that Japanese cast continued on into Bayonetta two. So there wasn't a j- it wasn't like it was translated. Uh, there wasn't even a Japanese cast for the original game. 
which is interesting. So, um, thought that was quite odd. Very different from how things usually are done. Um, what else? Uh, shout out to a couple TV series I've been watching real quick. Um, I've been going through Mad Men, and I'm on... Uh, season four, I guess now. I guess I just finished season three, so four out of seven I'll be starting, and uh, really enjoying it. Definitely a very slow burn, and it's different uh, from a lot of series we're used to. Like people aren't dying at the end of every episode. There's no gasp um, type of thing. It's very heady, very psychological. A um, lot of you know, kind of existential stuff going on. Um, so, but, you know, kind of a thinking man's series, if you will, and it's very well done, and, uh, really enjoying kind of the jazzy look at the early 60s so far, um, love that, so, uh, really enjoying that, and then I'm in season three of Justified, an FX show from several years ago that's really cool, it's about, uh, U.S. Marshal in Kentucky and uh, kind of his dealings with like the Dixie Mafia type of stuff and um, you know it's not a perfect show it's um, you know not like the highest budget and like the cinematography isn't anything to write home about but it is definitely uh, solid and the show is really well acted and pretty well written so um, that's where it really shines and um, the scenario itself is really interesting, so uh, enjoying that one as well. And uh, I mentioned that I had been watching Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and I'm like midway through season three at this point, and it only continues to amaze me and how far they're willing to go with like certain jokes and scenarios and plot lines. It's just fucking wild, even more wild than I remember seeing you know individual episodes here and there. So. Um, yeah, all good stuff. I watched um, A Star is Born, Jared. Was surprised at how much I love this movie. I nice. thought it was great. Yeah, I thought it was really, really, really good. And uh, both Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper killed it. Um, Bradley Cooper, you know, Sam Elliott plays his older brother in the movie. And Bradley Cooper kind of is almost doing like an impression of Sam Elliott, like with his voice and his almost like method acting. It's weird to see him like disappear into a character, even though he's not, he doesn't have like, you know, it's not like Christian Bale doing Dick Cheney or um, Gary Oldman doing Churchill. Like, they're not all like fattened up with like weird white hair and makeup or anything. It's just him, but he's like, so different in the way that he sounds and acts and moves and talks and so um, very well done movie and you know it is uh, somewhat predictable in some of the plot um, with it being kind of a, a musical you know A Star is Born is the title and that's what it's about is a rising uh, music star so um, but other than that there's still a lot of great stuff that I just had no I was not prepared for and not uh, not ready for how good the movie was going to be. So I really enjoyed that. And uh, also shout out to uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. Watch that as well. And um, pretty fucking cool, man. Uh, I like those Wreck-It Ralph movies. You know, they're not the fucking best in the world, but they're like good, solid, you know, fun and funny movies. So um, shout out to that for sure. Yeah, it's crazy that, like, uh, A Star is Born seems to, like, be a good movie every time it comes out. Uh, yeah, I didn't find out until after I watched it that it had been... This is, like, the fourth remake, I think. Yeah, it came out, like, in in the 30s, and then it came out in the 50s, and then it came out in the 70s. And then they even did, what, like, a Bollywood version? Which, of yep. course... Um, yeah, well, that's everything we've been playing, watching, experiencing... Let's hop into the news. Um, quickie news, news, news. Um, EA stock rose to $96 per share and completely eliminated its quarterly losses uh, a week into Apex Legends, which is crazy. So basically during their, Apex, fin bro. During their financial report, they reported that uh, there was quarterly losses 
and their stock dropped as it always does with investors because they're very fidgety um and then after apex legends came out their stock boomed and rose and it's actually higher now than it was before the drop um which is not surprising when a game like this comes out to what it came out to um on top of this vince zampella announced on monday of this week that it had reached 25 million players in its first week which is also crazy uh, its numbers are vastly outpacing that of Fortnite and of PUBG, which is not surprising considering it's following in their footsteps. Um, and obviously the influencer backing and all of that. Uh, it's crazy how big this game got as fast as it did. And the 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 thing I'll say is it's like the most solid battle royale I, I played the moment it came out, if that makes sense, you know. I talked about this last week. Like, PUBG came out, was struggling on console. I still enjoyed it. I mean, it even has issues on PC still with cheaters. Um, Fortnite is still in beta technically. It's not even fully released. Uh, and I still don't think that the gunplay in Fortnite is very good. Um, it's polished, but it doesn't mean it's good. Uh, and, um, yeah, this game just came out and it worked, ran well. Just solid release. And it's not surprising that people have jumped on. Uh, one thing that people didn't really talk about, Jordan, with Fortnite is that these streamers are streaming games 8 to 10 hours a day, and the top Fortnite streamers have streamed so many hours of Fortnite that when a new hit Battle Royale game comes on the scene, them being able to change to play something else is, you know, something they want to do. And I think that's yeah. something that maybe Fortnite didn't really think about, is that, yeah, they love your game, but the moment they have a competitor to give them a break, it's not to say they won't go back to Fortnite, but... You're streaming the same game eight to ten hours a day for a year and a half. You're gonna want to play something else, you know. So it's not surprising. Um, I can't imagine that, by the way, Jared. I was thinking about that recently. Of like, you know, it'd be one thing if you were streaming eight to ten hours a day, getting paid for it. That was your job, and you got to pick the games. And I'm gonna play a little Kingdom Hearts, and then I might jump to Resident Evil, and then, you know go back and play a Switch game from last year or whatever that I didn't finish. You know, do your Celeste B-sides. But think if you just... Your audience, the people that put money in your pockets, expected you to just be on Fortnite or on COD or on, you know, fucking Sea of Thieves, just grinding it out. Just every fucking day. Well, the same game. The hard part is that these streamers get big playing one game because they're good at it, so then it attracts viewers to watch them. And then they grow so big that they feel obligated to like, well, this, the audience subscribed to me or followed me because of that. I can't really play anything else. When in reality... Everybody used to be like, you play Red Dead Redemption yet? You're like, fuck video games. I hate video games. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if I was a professional streamer, I would definitely be a variety streamer. I could not, you know, allocate myself to doing the same thing. Not maybe not the same thing, but the same game over and over. No, thank you. Um... That's we all know crazy. you do ASMR, Jared. You got you got big money coming off that ASMR. I was gonna do a ASMR joke and get like real close to the mic, but I don't have to want to have to worry about that in editing, so I'm just not going to come my losses. I could take care of that. Um, <laughs> one interesting thing: uh, the former Telltale devs are actually making a new studio. It's called Ad Hoc Studio, and it's a venture dedicated to interactive narrative. Um, Ad hoc is Latin for created, basically for creating something for a specific purpose, so it makes sense. Um, I'd be interested to see if they partner with, like, Netflix, or they partner with Game Pass, or uh, some type of service for their interactive narrative stuff. Um, be interested to see where that goes, because they didn't necessarily say video games, they just said interactive narratives, and we saw Bandersnatch on Netflix yeah. and how that played out, so who knows. Um, Definitely interested to see where Netflix goes with interactivity from here on. I know that they had done it before Bandersnatch, but uh, you know that was a big deal when that came out. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting because like I played it on PS4 Bandersnatch, and like the controller vibrated when a decision was coming up and stuff. And so I was like, how would this be if it was just a remote? You know? Yeah. Uh, THQ Nordic reports that Darksiders 3 recouped its investments and remains a vital IP for them, so that's good. It was in a commercial failure. They made their money back. As, as to how much profit they made, who knows? Um, but they did report that they've at least made their investments back, so that's good. Um, 
I'm just seeing here. We have two bits of I would I would consider bad news. One of them is like speculative bad, and one of them is actual bad. So we'll start with the actual bad. Um, if you're living under a rock, you might have missed that Activision Blizzard uh, went on an earnings call on Tuesday, and Bobby Kotick, who makes millions and millions of dollars, stood in front of them and said, "Hey guys, we want to report that we actually came in with record numbers this year, um, more money than we've ever made." And at the same time, finally informed his employees who have been waiting two weeks, um, knowing that they were going to get fired at some point, uh, they fired over 800 people. Now, to put this in context, Activision Blizzard employs over 9,600 people. So this isn't their entire workforce or even a part of it. It's, you know, but it's 800 people who lost their jobs. Uh, thankfully, the gaming industry has reached out and a lot of these people are finding jobs elsewhere. The thing that sucks is reading from people who are like, I thought I was going to retire with Blizzard. Um, you had people who have been there since the original Warcraft that were fired. You have people... Jesus. Crazy. Because um, obviously Blizzard was, in the last couple of years, acquired by Activision or there's a partnership. Um, a lot of the people who were fired were actually Destiny um, support staff. So PR, marketing, social media, all of that stuff. Because, you know, they separated with... Um, Bungie, so they no longer needed those Makes people. Sense. The biggest issue here, layoffs are going to happen. I think there's a couple of things in here that make it scummy. The fact that you go in front of an investor's meeting, say you record record numbers, while at the same time going two weeks with having your employees not know if they're keeping their jobs or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in an investor's meeting, you're supposed to report profits as a whole point. But doing that literally at the same time that people are being informed they're getting fired is, like, I think, bad management and timing, in my opinion. Um, oh, yeah. and you know, we recently saw that the new CEO of Activision that came in got like a $15 million signing bonus. Um, people are, people are mad because these are jobs that didn't necessarily have to be fired. You know what I mean? It's just that way they can create greater, um, profit margins and, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Obviously, this goes into the bucket, drop a dime in the unionized already gaming industry bucket. But uh, it's just scummy on Bobby Kotick's part. Um, the one thing I want to say is, like, people are very easy to bash EA, justifiably. So I'm not saying you don't ha – you shouldn't. People are very quick to bash on Bethesda. Once again, if that's your prerogative, go ahead. But for some reason, people, like, give Activision this weird pass. Like, Call of Duty gets pooped on. Don't get me wrong. Like, people are like, oh, Call of Duty, it's awful. But when they look at the top, like, no one ever mentions Activision as being scummy. And if anything, they're just as scummy, if not more, than everyone else, you know? Um, yeah. It just seems, it's weird that people overlook Activision. Because the whole thing of, like, stalling microtransactions in Call of Duty, and reviews come out for the game, and then they implement him. Just a bunch of weird, gross stuff. Um... The, the whole Diablo mobile thing. <laughs> what, you guys don't have cell phones? Yeah. Um, yeah. It just, it's a it's an ugly situation. Obviously, it sucks for 800 people to lose their jobs. Hopefully, all of them land on their feet. Um, but the other part of it is this is a harsh reality of Bungie and Activision ending their partnership. That support staff, you know, they should... I think they, of all people, probably knew it was coming. It's like, what's the point of us being here? I don't know. It just sucks. There's nothing really positive to say when people lose their jobs, but it is a harsh reality, unfortunately. And, uh, yeah, people need to understand that Activision isn't uh, isn't better than anybody else. In a lot of ways, they're worse, if not even, with some of the people that think people think are the worst. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I don't know if there's anything much to add. <laughs> but, well, I just think that it's interesting from a non- uh, really like Blizzard fans perspective to see uh, and hear <clears> how <throat> oh, they're really coming to terms with the fact that you know Activision is like fully infecting Blizzard at this point exactly yeah Parasite and, uh, yeah exactly just like um, you know I think EA will do with Respawn as if they haven't already and then um, you know other situations I could go on and on about that but that is just unfortunate to see because um, you know Blizzard is so highly and has been for has been so highly respected for so long. Um, it's it's weird to see, like you said, guys that worked on the original Warcraft getting uh, 
knocked out of the ring. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, with Activision having basically control of Blizzard now for the most part, people who think that World of Warcraft is going to be around forever, don't be sold on that. Enjoy every minute you have with that game. Um, because I I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that one day we could just hear, hey, World of Warcraft servers are shutting down in a month or two months. You know what I mean? Um, you don't think they'll have a sequel already out by then? Oh, no. I don't think Activision believes in MMOs at all. Traditional MMOs? Mm-mm, not enough money there. I don't even think an MMO from Blizzard at this point would be successful. Follow to World of Warcraft? Activision successful. Keep that in mind. Not like profit margins. I think Activision is, is in the business of huge numbers. You know what I mean? And I, I just don't think it would be successful enough that they would want to... If it was if it was Blizzard on their own, I could see it. But not with all of this that's happening. Mm. If you see the way they're handling uh, Diablo as a franchise, uh, even Overwatch to some extent, it's like, I yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um Speaking of management that could possibly mess things up, uh, it was announced that uh, Jim Ryan has been appointed to president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment, effective April 1st. No, this is not an April Fool's joke. Um, And this has left PlayStation fans worried, uh, considering Ryan's infamous comments regarding backwards compatibility, where he said that those games look bad, no one wants to play them, and uh, backwards compatibility is never used. He also managed to take time out of his schedule to talk about crossplay, and he said that uh, basically they needed to protect the children on PSN playing Minecraft um, because they wanted to have a safe environment for people on PSN, kids especially, because, you know, Nintendo doesn't know how to do that, or Microsoft. And uh, there was another time, interesting enough, when he was talking about indies. You know, uh, that genre of game that PlayStation displayed during the announcement of the PlayStation 4 that really uh, had gamers fall in love with them. He said, there was a time to showcase indies back in 2013-14. It's, re- it's less relevant to do so now. So basically he said, why would we do backwards compatibility? It doesn't make sense. Why would we do crossplay? We need to protect our people. Who cares about showcasing indies? It's not relevant anymore. All of those things have PlayStation fans worried. Obviously I'm more of an Xbox guy than a PlayStation guy. I think this guy has made a lot of dumb... Uh, <laughs> statements uh, regarding all of these things. You, who's somebody who's I wouldn't say you're necessarily a diehard PlayStation guy, but you are a fan of theirs. Obviously number one out of I think all the consoles. Jordan, what's your take on this with Jim Ryan taking over? (coughs) Yeah, I think even just the way you explain my PlayStation fandom you say that because I, you know, give them a lot of shit obviously and and uh, love to point out their flaws, which are many. Um, and I've been pretty vocal about the fact that I'm worried about um, how they're handling the kind of transition into the next generation and you know, going dark on all these public facing events is really uh, weird and kind of upsetting, disappointing. Um, and this is, you know, unfortunately kind of continuing along that same line. It's weird, you know, we certainly live in a topsy-turvy world at this point. Um, and, but just super obvious situations like this where uh, someone who is obviously sort of a buffoon, at least when it comes to public comments, uh, gets promoted, you know, it's kind of opposite day um, in a lot of our books, but... Um, it does happen and it uh, will continue to happen unfortunately I'm sure but uh, I can't say it's enormously surprising because like I said they've had a string of in my opinion uh, quite poor decisions as of late and uh, has PlayStation as a whole has shown no signs of slowing up when it comes to that sort of stuff and we'll see if they're able to stumble into a decent position in the next generation or if they're going to you know, stumble right out of bounds, which is looking more and more like the situation at hand uh, as they continue down the field, if you will. So, we'll see. And that wasn't the only troubling thing for PlayStation this week. Um, so there was an interview with Sean Layden, a couple of them, 
Um, the one that isn't really an issue that I'll bypass real quickly is they were asking about why they're skipping E3, and he was basically saying, you know, we need to meet with our marketing <coughs> partners before then, yada, yada, yada. In my opinion, I felt it was spin. It just didn't really make sense Absolutely. to me. Um, just spinning why they wouldn't be at E3 this year. Um, the thing that troubled me, though, is Sean Layden said when asked about crossplay, uh, he said, oh, why doesn't, uh, why doesn't Sony allow more people to have it? We're open for business on this one. All it takes is for publishers and developers who wish to permission it. Uh, as ever, just work with your PlayStation account manager and they'll walk you through the easy steps. Basically putting all of the fault on developers and publishers, right? Saying that, yeah, of course crossplay works. It's easy. Just to go about it. It's on the permission of the developers. Well, shortly after that, CEO of Chucklefish, who's a publisher of a bunch of games, most recently Wargroove, which personally... Just an aside, I can't wait to play, get my hands on. Anyways, cool. uh, CEO of Chucklefish here, we just launched Wargroove with crossplay between PC, Switch, and Xbox, so I wanted to chime in. We made many requests for crossplay, both through our account manager and directly with higher ups, all the way up until release month. We were told directly from Sony, in no certain terms, it wasn't going to happen. From our side, we can literally toggle a switch and have it working. Just wanted to provide some balance on the issue and say that it certainly isn't a question of developers not having contacted their account managers. So he's basically, Sean Layden came out and said, developers need to handle it. And Chucklefish came out and said, we tried. You guys said no, it's not happening. Um, so, either... Calling him out. So, it's either... There's two things here. Either Sean Layden is lying... Or there's a, a huge disparity in communication between Sean Layden and other people at that company, which are I'm both sure bad. Sean Layden doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, yeah. Which are both bad, whether it's a lack of communication or him just lying. Which, this paired with him trying to spin the E3 thing, that's why, like, I understand why people are... are willing to back PlayStation given the benefit of the doubt that they have all of this figured out and they're skipping E3 because they're better than it and yada yada yada. They have great exclusives. I understand that. They're winning the console generation. I understand that. That doesn't mean that they can't and won't make mistakes. <laughs> you know? Doesn't mean that they can't fuck this whole situation up. Exactly. You know, to go back to kind of like my football metaphor or whatever, you can be winning the game by a lot of points and still lose by the end of it. Exactly. And it's, yeah. And, like, I don't want to go on a tangent, but really quickly, like, if you look at their last couple of E3 presentations, in part it looks like they're being full of themselves, but also the way they've managed their gaming portfolio and pulling away from indies and all of this stuff, they did reach a point where their E3 presentation this year if they have PlayStation 5 on the horizon, would be three of the four games they showed last year because Spider-Man came out. And they relied so heavily on displaying these new exclusives, these jaw-dropping exclusives, that the moment that their pipeline has a stall in it, because that's what happens with game development, games take a long time to develop, they are kind of stuck in a middle place right now, right? I don't know. It's very interesting... This whole thing with Jim Ryan is scary. If I was a PlayStation diehard, I would be cautiously pessimistic. Um, you know, I got in this conversation, just another quick side note. I got in this conversation with somebody, and they were saying, I don't know why you guys are so judgmental. He People don't get into these positions uh, and not know what they're doing. And I replied, basically talking about Don Matrick for Xbox. That guy was in a high position with Xbox. He completely destroyed the Xbox One announcement. And if people forget, he, when he left Xbox, he went to Zynga, and he destroyed that for Facebook as well. It's not always that the most intelligent people get these positions in these businesses. There's a lot mm -hmm. of other things that go into promotions and moving up in a corporate ladder. People think that, oh, no, automatically they, they promote the smartest, most intelligent guy. That's not always how this works. You know what I mean? I think people, people want to believe People fake it until they make it all the time. People think exactly. it until they make it all the time. And I definitely think that Don Matrick is probably one of those situations, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I'm not saying Sean Layden's a bad guy or he's faking it because he has done some good things for Sony as well. I don't think I'm I'm not as worried about the Sean Wearing Layden that thing. T shirt. That crash yeah. t shirt. 
I think the uh, cross by thing is a lack of communication. I I don't, me personally, I don't see it as him directly lying. He could have. The Jim Ryan thing is what's more important. I think that guy is a problem for Sony directly, um, just because he's so archaic in his beliefs and his detachment. It's whatever. Anyways, let's get into some good news. The Nintec, the N- Nintec, the Nintendo Direct happened. Funny enough, we were talking about it last week. Remember, we were like, "There's probably gonna be a uh, direct next week." It hasn't happened yet. Longest uh, gap between two directs. It happened. Some great stuff. Um, for me, I'll get this out of the way. There was no Animal Crossing, so that was like the one disappointing thing to me. But there was so many things in this direct that I thought it was a very solid direct. Some stuff dragged on a little long, but overall, I think it was a very solid direct for the beginning of the year. So people. weird that we didn't see Metroid Prime 4 in a uh, trilogy <laughs> release date, huh? Yeah. Uh, people were like, Pokemon, why wasn't that in the thing? Pay attention, guys. Pokemon always It'll gets its own its announcement. Own. It always yeah. gets its own announcement. I-, I know people like to joke about Pokemon. It's a kid's game. That thing is, that property is huge, and it wouldn't want to just be in a direct for an announcement. That company controls their own thing. They want to have their own day to celebrate. Plus... That be- it's still a little too soon after the Let's Go games. Uh, yeah. I mean, they normally have their announcements between like March and April, but yeah, I wouldn't. It wouldn't be surprising if they waited a little longer because of the release of Let's Go. You're completely correct on that. Um, let's get into it. We're gonna go in order of announcements. I was thinking about going in order of when these games came out, but I just figured it'd be easier to go through uh, the announcements as they were in the direct. Started off with a straight heat, Jordan, a banger. Super Mario Maker 2, finally. Um, coming out June 2019, that post-E3 spot. Uh, they've actually nailed this the last couple of years. Correct me if I'm wrong, it was 2017 was Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. <coughs> 2018 was Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. And then this year, it's Super Mario Maker 2. So that June period is when they get those Wii U ports, and it's great. Um I thought Mario Kart was in May of that year, but I might be wrong. Maybe it was around that time frame. I could be, I could, sure. I could be wrong. Um, sure. Either way, uh, it's coming out June 2019. Bunch of new features. Um, Super Mario 3D World assets, which is really cool. Um, they added the ability to make like um, the enemies that kind of follow you throughout the level. They also have the platforms that you can like uh, directionally input it traveling through an entire level like a caterpillar kind of if you know what i'm talking about mm-hmm. um looks great i've been wanting this forever um this tells me we're definitely not getting another 2d mario for a while uh on the switch um which kind of sucks man uh i'm not a fan of like the newer art style for mario uh it the, would the, be great though if switch was when they were like oh let's do a totally different style yeah i'd be 100 percent down for that jordan it's just that knowing Nintendo, I don't know if that would happen. You know what I mean? It yeah. seems like they're more, and we'll get uh, into this later on in the Direct, they're much more willing to change up Zelda than they are Mario, which is funny because I think Mario uh, Mario has less at stake. Like, you can make any art style, and people are still going to buy Mario, you know? Experiment. Um, anyway, super so, excited for that. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that I'm cool with this game. I think it looks cool, but personally, I'm really not into it. Oh, yeah. This is like... I just don't... Go ahead. I just don't... You know, I'm not into, like, creating levels and stuff and taking all that time and... Wouldn't even necessarily think I'd have too much of a fun, like, time, you know, just bouncing around levels, you know, playing friends levels or whatever it may be. And the fact of the matter is, like you said, this, if anything, does probably take away from us getting a regular old 2D Mario on the Switch. So that's, I would rather have that than this, uh, because this just isn't necessarily my style. Uh, But, you know, to each their own, and and I'm happy for you guys that are happy, because it is, you know, something that was going to come eventually, and it is something that's cool nonetheless. Um. So, I'm day one on this, 100%. Super excited. Wow. Uh, I've been wanting this for so long. Um, The one thing I will say is that it needs to have really good search optimization. Um, That needs to be key. Yeah, that's another thing. That sounded like a fucking nightmare for the original. The way people talk about that shit. 
the plus would be if it came with the built-in campaign. I wouldn't be we don't because we don't know really anything about the actual structure of the game and game modes. We just know like it's Super Mario Maker two. Who knows if they go into a treehouse and explain more? I would say there's a fifty fifty chance that there's a campaign in the game. Now that being said, I'm not trying to say oh Jordan buy this. I doubt it's the length of a normal 2D Mario game, but I do think there will be like a built-in campaign out separate from creating stuff. You know what I mean? For yeah, people to hop in and play. There's cool stuff that you could do with that too. So yeah, I could see it. Yeah, and that's the thing with these directs is we're getting to some games that I could care less about. Just like you're not really into Super Mario Maker 2. Um, there's a bevy of different things, and some things are going to hit for you, some things aren't. In your case, it sucks because we probably won't get that 2D Mario, but, you know, it is what it is. Next up, uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Um, we learned more about the team-up attacks, which are really cool, and then they showed off Captain Marvel. Obviously, you know, Marvel's like, hey, our movie's coming out soon. Feature her in your direct, um, yeah. which is cool. Um, do you think Deadpool's going to be in this game? You know, he... <clears throat> He I is could, in the original. I could totally see him doing an X-Men expansion, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, I know that we know the X-Men are in there. Like Wolverine. Wolverine, Storm. They're they're very yeah. heavily featured, yeah. So, yeah, I really... You know, I hope if they were going to do this that there weren't any, like, bullshit. Oh, well, you can't have the Fantastic Four, though. I you mean, know, I hope there's no dumb bullshit like that. A free update with like Shatterstar, Cable, and Deadpool would be pretty dope. Like those three coming mm -hmm. in, um, the X Force crew. Yeah, nothing much to say there. Summer 2019. Um, I would assume probably April May. Um, and we'll get into this at the end of the direct. But I do think with a lot of these announcements, we're getting another direct in less than two months. I would almost guarantee to solidify some of these dates. Um, but we'll see. Uh, next up, a, a franchise I'm not super familiar with, Box Boy. It's getting a follow-up sequel called Box Boy and Box Girl. It's a cute little puzzle game. Um, has over 270 levels. You manipulate boxes, you create them, and like disperse them around the level to get through it. Um, price point will be huge for me with this. If this is a $15, $20 eShop game, I might bat an eye on it because it looks fun to me. A cool little puzzle game. If it has the Nintendo tax on it, not staring oh anywhere near it but it did look cute and fun and it's cool to see an underappreciated franchise for nintendo get this announcement because i know somebody out there is a huge box boy fan so this was probably a great announcement for him you know doesn't really do much for me or you but that number one box boy fan out there in uh wisconsin is super excited um number one bbf exactly this was probably the one like one of the major weird down points of the direct in my opinion they're like Super Smash Brothers Ultimate version 3.0 coming soon. What's gonna What's it gonna have in it? Find out later. It's like why even have that in the the direct? Very weird. But they did weirdly <clears throat> tell us that Joker's coming before April. So mm. that wasn't known. Uh, so Joker for from Persona Five is gonna be releasing before April, which is cool. Um, the first DLC character was solid, Piranha Plant. I've been using him, really enjoyed it. Cool that you got him for free. I remember at the time, they, their messaging was weird, and it sounded like you needed to pre-order it, but you just needed to have purchased the game before January 31st. Very weird how they messaged that. Um, yeah. But, yeah, Joker's coming before April. Um, a game that I've been meaning to get to, I said I would get it when it got ported, and I'm a lying, lying liar. I need to get around to getting it, is Captain Toad Treasure Tracker. Uh, free co-op update, which is really cool. Shadow dropped that. That came out the day of the announcement. And uh, paid DLC, which will include five courses and new challenges for existing courses. They didn't give a price point on it. Um, I would assume probably like $12 is... Pro I Did you manage to see this at all in the eShop, Jordan? No. Yeah. I, would, I, I don't but, have a price you know, point for I've it. I've got my handy dandy Switch right behind me, Jared. I'm going to get to the next story and you update me as soon as you find out. Um, next up, had an update on Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, summer 2019. Uh, I'm not a fan of the art style in this game, personally. I don't... Here's the thing. I understand from a developer's perspective, it's cheaper, right, to do that art style, the 3D and a 2D space. It just has never looked good for me. It's one of the reasons that pushed me away from, like, Mega Man 11, 
Um, it just, I don't like that art style. I understand it's cheaper. I get why they do it. Awesome. Good for them. Just with the bloodstained art style is not doing it for me. Um, so, <clears throat> we've got Captain Toad Treasure Tracker plus special episode for forty five ninety eight. Okay. And then the regular game's forty, and special episode is five ninety nine. That's actually cheaper. That's like almost a little over a dollar per course. That's actually not that bad, I think. Plus the new challenges for existing courses, they could easily Nintendo tax that to ten bucks. I thought it was gonna be like twelve dollars. Also, uh, just before you know, I looked this up. I was about to say. Yeah, Jared, this is all well and good, but <laughs> I don't want to buy this game while it's still $60, and it's not, so we might be hopping in here, Jared. <laughs> I did not know. Yeah, it's good to know. Um, good price, I think. Five new courses, five ninety nine, pretty solid. Um, two more announcements. It's that- weird how... Sorry, it's just weird, like, him in the city, it's weird how much it looks like New Donk City. One of the new courses is a pirate ship. It looks super cool. Um, on a side nice. note, uh, these next two announcements do nothing for me. I've never been a Dragon Quest guy. Uh, Dragon Quest Builders 2, July 12, 2019. Great for people who love the first one. It has new features, including fast travel, underwater, <clears throat> a bunch of cool stuff there. Um, it's basically Minecraft for people who like Dragon Quest. Uh, Dragon Quest 11 Definitive, Dif- Definitive Edition S, because it's a Square Enix title. Um, it's actually launching exclusively on Switch, Fall 2019, and the big difference between this and the regular version is the overworld map you can change to classic Dragon Quest, and it also features the orchestral music from the original series. Which Her- is huge, yeah, Jared, people because people hate they the music in, in they, the Dragon Okay, Quest so world. just to explain this, they did an orchestral soundtrack, like if you got the collector's edition, it comes with a CD... For the soundtrack of this game, done by an orchestra, right? Yeah. But then the actual game itself features MIDI tracks for the soundtrack. And yeah. so, you know, in PC, they were able to mod that in, but if you're on PS4, it's like, well, what the fuck? And so, I was like, well, there's no way they're going to change that for the Switch, because that would just be weird. But I guess they are going to. Hopefully, they'll patch that in for PS4, because that sucks if you played on PS4. I'm glad I waited. Yeah. Uh, but also the other cool feature is the 3ds version that you can like, you can like change. Is it? Am I right here? You can like change the graphic mode to the 3ds version. Well, it's like classic Dragon Quest, like OG. I thought, I thought you could basically do almost like the Master Chief Collection, where you can literally hit a button and it goes into the alternate graphical mode. And I thought that you could do change it into the. Because, uh, you know, in Japan, this game was released on, like, PS4 and 3DS. And so, it, I it, it is just basically pay the, play the 3DS version. I think it is that. What I'm saying is it looks like classic Dragon Quest. You're not incorrect. I gotcha. Yeah, that version looks like classic, like, NES Dragon Quest. Um, okay. The overworld map and stuff. Um, some of these announcements don't have much to say, so we can get to the bigger stuff that we can talk about. Um, Disney Sum Sum. It's a party arcade game coming in 2019. Looks adorable. Disney characters that look like that weird balloon creature thing in Kingdom Hearts 3 that you ride on and farts. Um, I don't know the name of that thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, Starlink has a new Star Fox update coming featuring Star Wolf's lieutenants and Star Fox's buddies. Um, You're going to his name. I need to look it up. Uh, I think it's like Bouncy Bouncy something. That comes out April 2019. Nintendo, just hire the Starlink guys to make your next Star Fox game. Just do it already. You love them enough to put Star Fox in all of these goddamn things. Give them an expansion. Just have them make the next Star Fox. They might make actually a good one for once. Um, <laughs> next up, uh, Tokyo RPG Factory, who we know Jordan from mm-hmm. Lost Fear and I Am Setsuna. They showed yeah. off They showed off Oninaki. Um... Personally, I think this is my least favorite art style out of their three releases. Yeah. Um, this doesn't look like I Am Setsuna. This doesn't look like Lost Sphere. It's more chibi-ish. Um, yeah. Or chibi-ish. Um, but the premise is cool. Uh, the big hook is that you go between the world of the living and the world of the dead and communicate with them. And the big evil is people who have basically lost the way of light and can no longer re- resurrect themselves. Very interesting concept. 
That's coming out summer 2019. I don't know if you agree with me on this, Jordan. This game cannot do what Lost Sphere do- did and come out at sixty dollars if they expect to sell well. There's no reason. I think that it's the, fifty, but yeah. Yeah, too expensive, in my opinion. Yeah. I don't know if I'm outside the line. I think it was forty when it was re released on Switch. Yeah, it's it's weird that they kind of insist that these games are worth so much you know it's I don't know it's and weird. that's a, the difference though is like maybe they are worth that much but you have to play the market you know what I mean in your eyes it's worth it but to the consumer it's not this is meow wow meow wow alright <laughs> meow wow yeah interesting um Yoshi's Crafted World, another Shadow Drop. The demo launched the day of the Direct. It's coming out March 26th. We know about that. Super adorable, cute game. If you have a kid, definitely pick that up for them. Or, heck, if you just like to have a chill-out Yoshi adventure, go ahead and do that as well. Um, heck, have some Yoshi. I'm going to save Fire Emblem and uh, Legend of Zelda for the end because I think those are the two things we're actually going to talk about most. Um, yeah. They announced Tetris 99. It's like a weird Tetris Battle Royale. Yeah. Um, yeah. Free download for people who are Nintendo Online subscribers. So it's a pseudo shadow drop if you have a Nintendo Online. Uh, haven't played it yet. Not interested in it no. personally. Cool though. That's only, only the Battle Royale mode. It doesn't have classic Tetris in there, right? Yep, exactly. But it's free. Because I got to tell you, so. Jared, I had a good time with Puyo Puyo Tetris, but there's a lot of fucking bells and whistles, even when you kind of like choose the options to kind of take them down and just go bare bones Tetris there's still a lot of stuff that's like distracting and obnoxious about it and I I mean I just want to play some regular old Tetris on the Switch I'd love to play Tetris Effect even though that's not regular old Tetris but um, yeah I, I wish we had a release on Switch of kind of some more normalized Tetris and um I know that we'll get into this later. Uh, you weren't super impressed by Fire Emblem uh, Three Houses visual fidelity. I didn't have too much right. of an issue with it. Neither did Dom. And we'll get into that. And I definitely want to hear what you want to say. But the next three games we're going to talk about, I'm just going to hover over, were the wor- three worst looking games we saw during the direct. Dead by Daylight, which looked awful. Um, <laughs> it was probably one of the worst games I've seen on Nintendo Switch. Uh I just don't know what else. it looked terrible. If I was them as a company, honestly, I don't even know if it's worth it to downscale it to put it on the Switch like that. It yeah. looked terrible. Um, Grid Autosport looked okay for about 80% of the trailer. This is the realistic racer. And then when they started talking about the uh, collisions and the car crashes, oof. Did not look good. Uh, when cars were actually taking damage, did not look very good. Um, and then one of the other ones that looked terrible, Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered. Boy, howdy, did this look like an original PSP game. This thing looked awful as well. Oof, not great. Wouldn't it be nice if the Switch was just, you know, $100 beefier, and it was 400 instead of 3 and it was closer to having, you know, almost like a PS4 in your hands. Yeah, but I don't think that's the market necessarily Nintendo's going for, you know. And I don't even know if it would sell well if it was $100 more. Sure. Because we have to think about the Japan. Thing, that's I mean, that $399. If it was a dope-ass handheld that could do actual, like, 1080, maybe not 60, but 1080, 30 for, you know, like, maybe a little bit older games. But, gosh, that would be so cool for 399 And for 399 I do think they could beef it up quite a bit. Um, and that would be dope. Hellblade, which actually didn't look that bad, surprisingly. Um, obviously, I don't think this is a place you want to play Hellblade. The audio design and all that stuff, you want to play it on a PS4 or Xbox One. But it, I don't think it looked as bad as it could have. That comes out spring 2019. Um, Damon yeah, X- that's actually just a quick point on that, Jared. It does kind of suck that, yes, the Nintendo Switch is a home console, but like it doesn't necessarily have like super high fidelity or high definition audio interfacing, you know. I mean, you could do just straight HDMI, but I don't know that the games have, like, the DTS master track on them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, with uh, PS4 and Xbox One, we we can kind of rely on that more, a little bit more high quality. And, 
that sucks a little bit. But yeah, with Hellblade especially, that's something that that could actually come into question. We had uh, Delta Ruin Chapter One coming on February twenty eighth for free, obviously from Toby Fox. Um, Damon X Machina Shadow oh, Drop. So that's that's the kind of pseudo sequel to uh, Undertale. Undertale. Yeah, the first okay. chapter. Obviously, he did it as like a way to get more developers on board and show people what he's working towards. Uh, Damon X and Machina. Undertale is already on Switch. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm ninety percent sure, but we're going to straight to the eShop, Jared. Uh, Damon X Machina had a shadow drop of a demo. It comes out summer 2019. The game, um, MK11, April 23rd. Unravel, March 22nd. Uh, we had the Final Fantasy bunch. Final Fantasy 7 coming March 26th. Chocobo Mystery Dungeon coming March 20th. Final Fantasy 9 got shadow dropped for a travesty of a price. They're selling that boy for $21, which is highway robbery. Um, that's more than it was when it came out on PS4. <laughs> yeah. Um, Square Enix, man. Gotta love him. Um, Platinum showed off their new action game, Astro Chain, which looked interesting. $21. Stylized anime cops, April 30th, 2019. People think that that game might get delayed. Who knows? It's Platinum. You never know. Um, they made a statement about Bayonetta 3. Its development is chugging along. Um, Jeez. The last two games. What, do you have an update? I uh, gotta be honest. I got a little distracted here looking at this twenty-one dollar Final Fantasy Nine dial, which I just can't believe it's twenty-one dollars, Jared. Like twenty-one dollars. Yeah. Twenty ninety-nine. What? They're like, well, we had to hire a few extra people, so we're gonna have to charge that extra buck. Like, um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about the visual fidelity stuff last. Um, Fire Emblem Three Houses. They did a deep dive. Uh, they showed the three um, territories. That being Leicester, Fargus, and the Jerusalem Empire, red, blue, and uh, uh, yellow, the Hogwarts houses. It's coming out July 26, 2019. Uh, you're actually this uh, teacher at a monastery, and you choose which student you want to teach. One from each empire. One's Dimitri, one's Alengard, and I forgot the name of the other one. Um, one of them is an, they all so, have their. Sorry. Uh, Undertale is on Switch, currently on sale for ten dollars as opposed to fifteen, and uh, yeah, I th- I could have sworn it was on here. It was released September of last year. Yeah, so. nice. Um, each of the kids has a unique ability. Uh, one's an archer, obviously. Um, Fire Emblem combat styles. Gameplay looked good. I'm actually this this trailer. Here's the thing. It was very lore intensive, so I understand if people aren't into that type of stuff, they could have got mm. bored or didn't like it. For me, I ate it up. I loved every minute mm. of it. I loved the voiceover. I loved him explaining the empires. I loved all of it. Um, this trailer sold me on Fire Emblem Three Houses. I was actually worried uh, about this game. Um, what I will say about the visual fidelity is, it's I think it's perfectly acceptable for me. Fire Emblem's never been a franchise that has been known for it. That being said, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't try to do better, right? On more on mm. on hardware with more performance capability. I completely understand that. Um, but for me, it wasn't a deterrent. Um, honestly, having, in my opinion, having Dead by Daylight and Assassin's Creed Three uh, in this direct actually made it look a lot better. <laughs> because wow. in comparison, those games looked awful. Um, and I do think the cutscenes look super dope. The anime cutscenes. Um, See, even those, man. Like, oh, I think those looked great. I yeah. Even I, those were just a little bit off because they're not just like straight up regular two D animated cutscenes. Like a lot of. Well, some of them are. The, some of them are. Some of them are. The one where they're walking through the forest is exactly what you're saying, but the first one uh, is flat two D animation. Yeah, for those that may not play as many like Japanese games, there's a lot of them in uh, uh, Fire Emblem included. Where and some of them are just like the opening cinematic because they spend a lot of yep. budget on that, just kind of like reel you in, and you just get one nice one at the beginning. But some of them have them throughout where JRPGs will have, you know, regular in-engine 3D cutscenes or just the characters animating normally. But then a lot of them, it's almost like. Uh, and some of them do actually get anime studios to just do anime 2D cutscenes. Some of them do it in-house. 
um, <clears throat> you know, a good example of that is like Nino Cooney on the first game where like Studio Ghibli are doing actual Studio Ghibli scenes yeah. for a lot of the cutscenes, and then there's also the in-engine ones. So, yeah, I just thought that uh, even those weren't quite right, didn't feel quite right to me, and um, the graphical fidelity, it's not necessarily, you know, I'm not that type of person, Jared, where I would... There are very few reasons where I would not play a game other than it being not fun to play. You know, there's... Um, I know you mentioned, like, yeah, I don't think I'd be super into playing as a dominatrix in Bayonetta or whatever <laughs> like that. Like, there's very few things that could deter me in, the, in that sort of sense, right? But um, So that's not even entering into my mind with this game. I'm certainly excited for it, and we'll be playing it at one point or another, most likely at launch. It's more just the fact that... Uh, yeah, it looks graphically very rough to me, and I do think that they could have done better. This is them jumping from 3DS to Switch, so I can kind of get that. But They also don't get the budget uh, that other franchises for Nintendo do. Fire Emblem doesn't sell well. Yeah, and I think that this is them trying to get it to sell well. Yeah. Uh, the main point is just that I think they could have done a better job regardless of what they had, because it's not even necessarily like how sharp things look or the crispness. It's that I, I think the actual uh, art style and graphical design to it is there's been poor choices made and there's been some lack of inspiration or creativity there, in my opinion. So even compared to other Fire Emblem games. So uh, <clears throat> it just looked a little bit dull uh, as, you know, as well as it not looking sharp, not looking uh, crispy or, or really high fidelity. It also looked a little bit uninspired, and so that really kind of compounded into a pretty big negative for me. But, um, you know, there's been ugly games that I've really enjoyed playing before, or uh, less than appealing, I should say, maybe. Um, so, still excited about this game, but, um, you know, just certainly didn't get more hyped off of what I saw visually. Uh, but the Fire Emblem games are... Uh, sound whenever it comes to the actual strategy role playing battle scenarios which I do enjoy and, and have gotten real into that genre in the last year or so so like I said I'm certainly going to be uh, interested in this game and it is you know it's a strategy JRPG so it is right up my alley at the end of the day fantasy as well so um, and I, I can appreciate a series that's kind of more anthology driven where, you know, the <clears throat> individual entries in the series, especially when there's lots of them, aren't necessarily intricately interconnected. So, uh, you know, Final <laughs> Fantasy, you don't need to play eight to get nine. Uh, there are some sequels that uh, branch off uh, with individual worlds, but uh, I'm glad that you don't necessarily need to have played... Um, the last couple of Fire Emblem games to be caught up for this one, and that's great, you know, jumping in on the Switch. So, shout out to them not making three separate games for forty dollars either. You know, yeah, Rata I was and, uh, about to go into that because that is, you know, you don't have to play the sequels or you don't have to play all the the prequel games to get it, but you do have to buy three separate games if you're talking about. Um, I always think of that Awakening game as the Japanese title. Uh, I don't think... Was it Awakening? It's... Hold on. I always... I'll, I'll look it up. Don't worry. if... Fire Emblem If was the Japanese title, which I always thought was interesting, because it's like if you go down these different paths, that's why there's multiple games. There's like a path A, path B, and then a, a C path that is, you know, convergent between the two, it seems. Maybe that's how they did it. I don't know. But anyway, it was confusing nonetheless and I'm like you said very glad you know they certainly could have done it since it's called three houses I'm sure they could have figured out a way to do that but it's nice that they decided to, to fit it all into one game somehow or another. uh fates birthright conquest and fates. Re uh, yeah. revelation yeah um yeah. the last thing on there uh, the real quick I, I was surprised that I was really interested in the premise and the character design because uh, that's often what pulls me away from Japanese games. 
Um, Honestly, but I actually liked it with this game. Skimmed over those parts because you know me, I love being as blind as a bat. Exactly. When it comes to story. Yeah. And they were doing the thing where it's like, is this the opening movie? Where they're like, you know, showing the map and it's like the lands of Elandria or whatever the fuck it's called and Falden uh, or whatever Felden. Yeah, you can like kind of see them introducing this world. It's like this might be the opening movie, so I don't want to see this and so. Yeah, I really just looked at the graphical fidelity, and I know that that seems like, well, why would you not look at the other stuff to kind of accurately uh, That's fine. critique? But <laughs> but the those parts aren't what I'm worried about, you know. And and we've I've at least been worried about the the graphics um, since that trailer we got. Whenever the last time we got a trailer was, where there's just a little bit of gameplay on the battlefield, and everybody was like, oh, it's not what we expected, you know. The thing I, I wish was- they had gone with something maybe that could fit a little bit better on the Switch. Maybe, like, I understand that they probably don't have the budget of Breath of the Wild, but, you know, maybe something cel-shaded that could um, be on a lower budget and still look really pretty would be nice, but, you know, whatever. That's an artistic choice. It's cool that I have options for June and July, though, where we usually have droughts. It's like I have Super Mario Maker 2 in this, which is Oh, my gosh, dude. Yeah, to hear that Fire Emblem is coming out, uh, I guess, June 26th? July 26th. I'm so, July 26th, that sucks. But uh, anyways, you <laughs> know, June, July, like we always talk about, is can be a drought, and that's obnoxious, but uh, it looks like Fire Emblem will be coming through on the old switcheroo. The last Coming thing... on the switcheroo. The last thing to get to on this uh, kind of lengthy episode, it's fine, two-man show, Valentine's Day special, um... Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, uh, obviously this was the game that was released on the Game Boy in 1993. It had a remake uh, uh, DX, Link's Awakening DX, um, which Mm -hmm. essentially just colored the game for the most part. Um, And now we have this reimagining on Switch. Um, Gorgeous new style. The anime opening was beautiful. I would watch yep. a show with that art style. It is so gorgeous. We gotta get it at some point, right? Yeah. Um... I really like the new art style for the game itself. We talked about earlier with Mario how we hope that the next 2D Mario, even the 3D one, heck, that one, not Odyssey, but like the new World, whatever that is, uh, Mario World mm-hmm. game, like they should just try different art styles. Because like even with, um, I think somebody, it might have been, it was somebody from IGN basically put it together that in the last 15 Zelda games, there's been 13 different art styles or something like that, um, which is crazy. Uh, this new Link's Awakening looks really cool. It has like um, a tilt shift kind of am- camera angle. Um, very, uh, how would I put it? It reminds me of a lot of like the classic reindeer Santa Claus movies. That are. Uh, it the, reminds me of Pikmin, where it's like looking looking in on these little things yeah. on the ground, and there's like this massive uh, depth of field uh, um, uh, lens blur around the edge of everything. Um, So that's what it reminds me of. And I was saying in our chat that I think, um, you know, with the anime intro and then the gameplay art style that we were talking about, I think it's really cool that they've gone with these art styles because the original already has a gorgeous pixel art um, vibe going for it and so it would be very difficult unless they were just going to straight up replicate that it'd be difficult to match that level of artistic quality and I think that they have in, in the decisions that they made here I hope it's their December game I would love to get this and enjoy it over Christmas break that'd be really cool because um, hmm. it said 2019 with like the games already know in June and July I don't think they would release Link's Awakening maybe in like November possibly I've never played the original. It's not a very long game either, which actually kind of excites me because I've heard about how good it is. I know the twist on the game, but I don't really even consider it a twist. I don't want to say it for people who don't know. Um, But I'm still excited to play it. I really dig the art style. I think this is a good way to handle a remake slash reimagining is that you just change the art style and you keep everything exactly where it was in the original game Um, because a lot of people consider that original game a masterpiece. And for a new audience to get into it, you don't need to change the gameplay because it's already solid. Just give us something refreshing. And like you said, the original already had an iconic look. Go for another one. 
a different iconic look because if you try to recreate it what does that do what's the point of remaking it period why not put it port it right so yeah yeah and i've got to say you know this is really solidifying for me as an audience member looking at nintendo this is them saying we're going to continue with these remakes because samus uh, returns did it with well not even that just with zelda they did it with ocarina and they did it with majora uh, both on the 3ds and now they've done it here <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I'm hoping that that's the case that they continue to choose games in the give us Oracle, the you cowards! Part of the series. ages and seasons. Yeah, we'll see. So uh, I'm sure that that's got to be the case that they're going to be continuing on with that. And um, yeah, like you said, it could be happening in other series too because we've already got uh, the Metroid Samus Returns on 3DS. So. Um, I think it's good. Remakes of games usually end up, if they come out, they end up being pretty good, you know? Yeah. I mean, we haven't really had that many. If you look at the entire history of games, and there's not that many of them that are uh, widely just groaned at. So, Real quick, a uh, small question, then we'll get to what we're going to be playing. Um what do you think is more likely, uh, a follow-up to Breath of the Wild in the same art style, like, you know, uh, maybe the same engine, so Ocarina and Majora, right? Or uh, a Super uh, Super Mario Odyssey 2 in the vein of Galaxy and Galaxy 2? What do you think is more likely that we definitely, get? Definitely now it's Odyssey 2, because I think anyone who's now holding their breath for a, kind of a Majora's Mask to Breath of the Wild is... Uh, mistaken because this is taking the place this Link's Awakening remake yeah Uh, I think that has dashed any hope that you may have of a quick follow up to Breath of the Wild in the Majora's Mask style so yeah I think if any of any of those two were to happen it's got to be the Mario and the fact that Odyssey is like one of one of their only major Switch releases that hasn't gotten an update (laughs) I mean, they got like yeah, the Luigi. DLC. They got the, like the Wii Luigi update or whatever for like the speed no runs, like story but... expansion. Yeah, no paid DLC, big chunky thing. So chunky monkey. Uh, in terms of what we're going to be playing, um, Kingdom Hearts three for me for sure. Apex Legends. Mm. I was planning on actually downloading Crackdown three tomorrow, but like I said, I'm going to get to that game sometime this year. I just can't prioritize it uh, right now. Also, want to issue an apology. I think. There's no chance that Days Gone reviews as badly as Crackdown 3, knock on wood. I mean, Crackdown 3 is sitting like at a 62, man. It's not surprising. Um, I'm not, like, mm. shocked by that score. But that, you know, we were talking about when we were comparing Days Gone and Crackdown 3, and I said, at its height, I think they could be even. Meaning, if Crackdown 3 comes out and is the best it could be, I think it could be, like, a low 80s, right? Now that it's a yeah. 61, 62, there's no way that Days Gone reviews that badly. And if it does, I'll eat my words, but I would be shocked <laughs> if Days Gone is th- reviewed that poorly. I don't think it will be, so I want to apologize for ever thinking that was a possibility. I am now almost not more hyped for uh, Crackdown 3, but I'll just say I think I'm going to have a blast with that game when I buy it for 30 or 40 bucks, you know. I think that's going to be... Man, you can even just go on Game Pass. Like, you get it played on Game Pass for free. Well, not free, that but... That is true. You know, right, yeah, I get Cheaper. You, but, it, you know, not every... I can't be, like, not even a diehard, but I can't even be, like, a fanatic for every fucking franchise. Exactly, right? like, yeah. I, I have my Metal Gears and my Witchers and, you know, now stuff like Spider-Man and infamous you know there's so many series that i fucking love to death it's like um if crackdown comes out a series that i don't even care that much about and it's just a decent game but it's something that i can pop into my xbox like i said when it's 30 bucks and just have a blast sometimes that's okay you know that not every series is popping out masterpieces you know sometimes i can be okay that the series that i'm not like ultra invested in is is just putting out something that may not be the best thing in the world and I know that that sucks for huge Crackdown fans but you know just be happy this game saw the light of day uh, there was there could easily been a point where this game was cancelled <laughs> if we're oh, being yeah. completely honest uh, and I think from what I'm reading with reviews Jordan 
critically it's a 60 in the low 60s i think it's like 62 or whatever and they're saying yeah it's not a great game but almost every review i've seen says if you're a fan of the series buy it you'll love it so wow if you Never lo- played a crackdown i played but one I do. and two came with the halo beta so i oh, nice. bought it because of that <laughs> way back when yeah i mean you know that uh i love superhero games and love um Games similar to this, you know, I enjoyed prototypes, stuff like that back in the day. So, um, there's something to be said for that. Big sandbox, uh, goofy sandbox games like that. Sunset Overdrive, you know, is very similar to Crackdown. So, yeah. I'll definitely be playing it at some point. But, uh, you know, of course, it would it would be cool if it was like a fucking masterpiece but what does a crackdown masterpiece look like you know what is like the campaign that they're laying down on the table where you're like oh my god man you gotta play you well, know like i'm just glad that this game finally came out it was <coughs> xbox's final fantasy 15 last guardian i just wanted out already get past it it's out now move on um yeah, yeah. because i do think the next era of xbox exclusives are going to hit a higher uh standard than crackdown i 3. gotta say i've felt relief since kingdom hearts is Three has been released. Yeah, you know? I felt relief when Last Guardian and Fifteen were released because people would kind of shut the fuck up about it. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's why I feel Crackdown Three. I, <laughs> that's how I feel about Half Life Three. Personally, is like, could we get it out so that people will shut the fuck up about it? Uh, yeah. But yeah, with Kingdom Hearts Three, it's like, okay, we can stop all the fucking theory videos. Not that they aren't already started for Four. Like I was talking about getting spoiled earlier, but. Well, we can kind of chill out on that for a little bit or have a little bit less of the din just, you know, uh, blasting your eardrum because that can get old when there's just, like, the the pressure cooker can just get so hot, you know, with, with all that stuff uh, just welling up over all the years of anticipation, so... Really quickly, uh, what are you going to be playing for the following week? We're running... We're, we're on record pace right now, Jordan. <laughs> mm. Uh, we'll surely be playing Kingdom Hearts 3, hoping to finish that. It's about time that I need to go ahead and put that away. Not even because I want to, but just because... 12 uh, Reasons the Secret Ending was great. Let me explain the secret ending. Yeah, it's like thumbnails are spoilers and, and video titles are spoilers. It's like I didn't even choose to click on a video and spoil myself. But anyways... Um, that and you know, looking at this price now, Jared, I might be hopping a little Captain Toad. Oh, nice! Uh, with this sale that we got going on, since like I said, I was waiting for it to come off a of sixty. Um, and I know that we're not uh, gonna have played it uh, by next podcast, but I wanted to know, Jared, have you decided what your starter javelin is? Your jav. Well, in so, the anthem, uh, it's gonna be the big boy. I forgot the name. The, the Colossus. So Metro is actually reviewing. Yeah. Uh, Metro Exodus is reviewing very well right now, which is good. It comes out tomorrow. Colossus, Storm, Interceptor, Ranger. Uh, Colossus. Colossus. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, Metro Exodus comes out this week. Uh, it's reviewing very well. I'm waiting till the Anthem reviews come out before I decide which one I'm purchasing. If they both, wow. if they both come out to even reviews, I'm getting Anthem first because I can play Metro at any point during the year. Anthem is kind of like a be in the moment kind of thing, um, but wow. if Anthem doesn't review very well, I'm picking up Metro first. I'll get to Anthem later wow. in the year, but yeah. I thought you were day one for sure on Anthem, but I was, I'm but just now come Met- into being day one. Metro is reviewing really well, and I not a lot of my friends are middling on if they're going to get it or not. So like, you know what I mean? Yeah, and you're not like me where like. The multiplayer aspect does matter to you. The friend aspect does matter to you, so that is important. Exactly, um, yeah. But Colossus, so, to answer your question. Yeah, so you're talking about Colossus, class, uh, and then the just to kind of explain them, yeah, you said the big boy, kind of the titan, the the uh, tank, if you will, is the Colossus. Then you got kind of the mage is the storm. The interceptor is like the rogue or the assassin that gets in there with the knives and the melee, and then the ranger is like your more standard kind of Iron Man looking suit. Um, so I think I'm going to start, because you get all four of them throughout if you just keep leveling up. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the Storm Mage class, uh, which is 
basically I like to mess with the equivalent of that in Destiny, which is Warlock, right? So yeah, um, I've I was a Warlock in Destiny One and Two when I played, and uh, looks like I'll be starting with Storm here. Interceptor's cool, but I don't love melee. I do love how quick and like assassin like they are, but. Um, getting in there for the melee in this specific game, I don't necessarily know I'd want to do that. And then, besides that, I would probably pick the Ranger after Storm because um, I usually like kind of being balanced. Um, but I do think once I, whenever I do get uh, to messing around with the Colossus, I think I'll have a fun time with it. It just probably wouldn't be what I'd want to like continuously play as since he's such a big boy. Uh, but we'll see. So I'm starting to get hyped on Anthem, man. Starting to get there. So uh, shout out to if you fun. if you guys who are listening haven't seen it, uh, Oat Studios, which is Neil Bloomkamp's. Uh, yes. Thank uh, you for mentioning. Production company. They released a, sh- a short called Conviction for Anthem. Uh, gorgeous, <laughs> beautiful. I want a movie of it. And yeah, so it's a live action thing. And Jared, I had honestly been wondering, like, oh man, what happened to Oat Studios? Because it's been a few months since they released a short film, and then all of a sudden this pops up the announcement for it I'm like up oh, there's what a studio has been doing so I was glad to see that they're still alive and well and uh, excited to watch this little prequel before the game comes out yeah exactly um, Dom should be back next week thank you guys for listening if you can please leave us a review on iTunes follow us there if you just like the audio version if you're watching on YouTube leave a like Hit the bell notification so you know when our new podcast goes up, usually on Sundays. And uh, subscribe, because that definitely helps us grow as well. Follow us on Twitter at CTRLINT, that's Controlled Interest Abbreviated. You can follow me at Jared underscore. You can follow Jordan at Melomotus. And Dom, who's not with us today, is Dom's Oreos. We'll catch you guys next week. Peach.